Okay. So, uh, in discussions of far-right American extremism, we usually uh, dismiss, overlook, or just ignore women's roles entirely. Sometimes we even paint them as wins for women or for feminism, despite their aggressive content of their beliefs. But both the history and the present of the far right is littered with women who spent their lives advancing authoritarian, fascist, and white supremacist ideology. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lowen Bober and their outsized influence in Congress being a current example. So white women's work on behalf of far right American extremism has always been complicated by the co-occurrence of misogyny with white supremacy in the US. So as Tracy Lanera argues in her 2023 on the alt-right's misogyny paradox, far-right women face a Maryland Fry style double bind in which the better they promote their far-right extremist ideology, the more misogynistic backlash they face within their own organizations for their unbecoming behavior. But despite their in-group pressures for more feminine or servile behavior, far-right women seem to display all of the arrogance we associate what are we and have come to expect from an extremist believer um, when interacting with anyone outside their group. So the simultaneous arrogance to out-group members and servility to in-group members seems like a paradox since arrogance and servility are thought to be opposites. Um, but I want to say that this paradox is solvable in two different ways. The first is through the limitations owning view of intellectual humility. Um, on this view, there are two ways to be servile and two ways to be arrogant um, along either the access of uh, owning your strengths or owning your limitations. So conceivably, you can be servile on one dimension and arrogant on another. But while this explains how individuals can be both servile and arrogant, I don't find it particularly convincing as a group-based analysis. The second way is to ask whether these attitudes we see in far-right women are not based on their individual strengths and limitations, but instead on their in-group identity. They are arrogant as a member of their far-right group with respect to anyone who does not belong. And as we were speaking of the American far-right, this arrogance is based on an identity of white supremacy. So um, why might it be important to explain this discrepancy? For one, uh, the in-group in servility, um, this oppression that they face as women in a patriarchal movement is one of the factors used to release far-right women from responsibility for their bad behavior and racist views. We may say that as victims themselves, far-right women bear less responsibility for their part in perpetuating white supremacy. But their outgroup arrogance contradicts this sentiment. We can see not just in the US's current political culture, but throughout US history as well, um, white, right-wing, and far-right women actively promote and uphold white supremacy. Um, if you want some examples, I highly recommend these three books. Um, resolving this apparent discrepancy between servility and arrogance and highlighting their dependence on the group identity of white supremacy lessens the exculpatory force of their in-group servility and possible victim victimization. So uh, the rest of this presentation has three aims. The first is to give an overview of arrogance and um, servility as they are related to intellectual humility. This will use the limitations owning view of intellectual humility. And with these definitions in hand, the second aim is to briefly overview examples of both servility and arrogance in far-right women. And then the final aim is to detail both the group identity view, which is largely based on Michael Lynch's 2019 Know-It-All Society, and to explain why I find the group identity explanation so much more persuasive than the individual explanation. Um, and briefly, since this is an international and inter interdisciplinary conference, let me acknowledge that I am focused on American far-right women in particular. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't share my philosophical reasons for that here, but I am happy to do so in the Q&A. Okay, so the limitations owning view of intellectual humility proposes that intellectual humility consists in proper attentiveness to and owning of one's limitations. So deficient attentiveness to your limitations or under owning your limitations is arrogance and excessive attentiveness to them is serv servility. So humility then is this mean between arrogance and servility. Um, maybe I'll move over a little farther to 
I didn't realize I was blocking this. Um, so, but as this definition of humility doesn't account for uh, attention to your intellectual strengths, um, what the authors do is uh, propose a structure of relations between humility, proper pride, arrogance, and servility. So proper pride then is the owning of one's strengths um, and lies in the mean between ex excessive and deficient attentiveness to your strengths. So then if you pay too much attention to your strengths, you will also be arrogant. Um, and if you pay insufficient attention to your strengths, you will also be servile. So then proper pride also becomes this mean between excessive and deficient owning of your strengths. So on this view, it is technically possible to be both arrogant and servile at the same time. Um, they're just, it's either on one axis or the other. You can conceivably, at least, um, be inattentive to your limitations and inattentive to your strengths. Um, the problem that the authors address with this in their paper is that um, it seems like it's internally incoherent to be both servile and arrogant at the same time. So what they end up saying is that if someone has full internal rationality, um, they probably won't end up being both servile and arrogant. But they also say that it's a human condition to be less than fully rational. Many of us are not fully rational, um, so it's perfectly possible to be both servile and arrogant at the same time. We don't need to assume full internal rationality. I'll get this more, uh, into this more later in my talk, but I briefly want to address one of the reasons why I don't find this to be a satisfying explanation of simultaneous servility and arrogance, especially as we see in far-right women. Um, historian Linda Gordon has a great line in a 2021 paper where she says, most of the time the label irrational has little explanatory value. Labeling something as, something as irrational tells us nothing about why the irrationality may have occurred. It simply gives us a way to dismiss it. Further, it puts us in the position of being a mind reader, attributing an internal state to someone whose thoughts we don't actually have access to. But despite my hesitation about using the limitations owning view as an explanation for the phenomenon I'm looking at here, it does provide an excellent overview of the traits I'm interested in. So before I move on to examples of servility and arrogance in far-right women, I briefly wanted to touch on what servility looks like in action. We all tend to feel as though we recognize arrogance in others when we see it. Um, we accuse celebrities and politicians of being arrogant all the time. Uh, but servility is something that can be harder to track, and particularly when we are talking about marginalized individuals who may be culturally expected by their oppressors to be servile. Um, as Jose Medina points out, persons who are marginalized along multiple axes of their social identities are at greater risk for servility. Persons who are um, privileged along multiple axes of their social identity are at greater risk for arrogance. So to that end, I briefly wanted to overview uh, some of the interpersonal dispositions associated with servility as proposed by Heather Baddeley's 2021 paper, Countering Servility Through Pride and Humility. Um, Baddeley is one of the authors of the Limitations Owning View, so the above distinctions all apply for this paper. So briefly, she suggests that the servile are likely to over-attribute knowledge and competence to their interlocutors. Uh, to under-attribute knowledge and competence to themselves, they may defer to their interlocutors whether or not those interlocutors are knowledgeable or competent. They may revise their beliefs when they are in conflict with points raised by their interlocutors, um, whether or not that uh, revision is merited. Okay, so with those descriptions in hand, uh, I want to briefly overview some examples of far-right women in both servility and arrogance. So to begin with servility, let's look at the cultural phenomenon of the trad wife. If you are lucky enough to have not heard that term before, it's slang for traditional wife. Uh, there was a recent Guardian article, um, I think it was from May 31st, by uh, Saya Norris, who is the author of Bodies Under Siege, How the Far Right Attack on Her, um, Reproductive Rights Went Global. So she, discuss, or she defines the trad wife cultural aesthetic this way. Long floral dresses are the norm, idolizing a mythic past of feminine modesty. Women should be covered up, 
as their bodies are just for their husbands. A woman's role is to stay at home, serving her spouse domestically and sexually, while her partner goes to work to support her. Men should discipline women. Tracy Lanera cites a Utah-based Ayla Stewart as the quintessential trad wife. Stewart shot to fame for instigating the White Baby Challenge in 2017, which called on white women to match or beat the number of children she had, which is six. Stewart's Instagram handle is wife with a purpose and features mostly shots of her white children and idyllic home life. Stewart has started out as a liberal and a feminist. Now she doesn't hesitate to malign critics of the trad life or really anyone who refused to embrace the culture. If they didn't model their life on the values of the past, they were lazy or worse. Um, I also want to briefly turn to Andrea Dworkin's 1983 Right Wing Women. Dworkin's book is the classic feminist text for questioning why right wing women agitate for their own subordination to patriarchal men, speculating that the right exploits women's fear and offers them chivalrous protection. While Dworkin's book is now 40 years old, much of the analysis still feels intimately familiar. Her descriptions of right wing women remain resonant and recognizable. She says, the right wing woman conforms in order to be as safe as she can be. Sometimes it's a militant conformity. She will save herself by proving that she is loyal, obedient, useful, even fanatic in the service of the men around her. She is a happy hooker, the happy homemaker, the exemplary Christian, exemplary Christian, the pure academic, the perfect comrade, the terrorist par excellence. Uh, we can see both in the trad wife and in Dworkin's right wing women, the deference of the servile. In submitting herself to her husband, the trad wife is intended to place herself completely under his authority, including his right to punish her as he sees fit. Um, and again, the heteronormative language is very intentional. There is no, in this far right white supremacist narrative, there is no room for non heteronormative relationships. So for the arrogance exhibited by far right women, it's perhaps easiest to see and track this with activists as they are the most vocal and well-documented. As I mentioned in the introduction, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lowen Boebert probably come to mind immediately for any Americans in the room. For my example here, I turn to a, um, one presented by journalist Sayward Darby, uh, first in a 2017 article in Harper's and later in greater depth in her 2020 book, Sisters in Hate, which if you really want a deep dive into three far-right women, that is the unfortunate um, it's unfortunate in general, but it's a very deep <laughs> look at uh, interviews and following along with three different far-right women. So at a 2017 conf uh, alt-right conference in Stockholm, the American-born Lana Lochtef told the audience, be loud, our enemies have become so arrogant they count on our silence. So Lana Lochtef is a blonde, blue-eyed co-host of the alt-right media company Red Ice with her Swedish husband, Heinrich Palmgren. Darby's interview with Lochtef gives a great verbatim example of what I see as Lochtef's arrogance of practice. I'll quote it at length here. This entire thing is a quote. So Lochtef, Lochtef had asked Darby, the journalist, what is feminism to you? My answer, that women should have equal opportunities and to be able to choose, say, to stay home or to be the CEO of a company, left her exasperated. In the West, we already have that, she replied in a rush. Our men have propelled us like crazy. She ticked off examples. White women were the first to fly a plane, to go into space. Societies like the Viking worship gods of both genders. Feminism, the genesis of which she pins roughly to the early 20th century, did not make things better for women, Lochtef concluded, but it did make them worse for men. It's easier for a woman to get a job because of affirmative action, she said, while the white male is on the shit list. So even in this short paragraph, we can see Lochtef's refusal to take Darby's view seriously. She believes she has an answer and that Darby's insistence that women do not have equal opportunities is incredibly off base. She's an activist and media personality in the alt-right um, and has plenty of opportunity to insist that her position is the correct one. But at the same time, she demurs when Darby asks her if she's a leader. Lochtef said, maybe on some level, I'm not sure I would take credit or put myself in that position. Darby says that in the broad hyper-masculine constellation of the alt-right, Lochtef may be right, but that her position amongst the w movement's women is a different matter. 
There has always been a girl in the pack that's been more of the outspoken one. Locked have continued. I've never been the follower. So political in-group identity. So in-group bias has been a well-documented psychological phenomenon since the groundbreaking research of uh, Taj Typho at all in 1971. Um, in the recent years of increasing American political polarization, political scientists have tracked not only polarization at the congressional level, but also at the level of the mass public, culminating in what um, Iyengar and West would call robust outgroup prejudice in its own right, comparable to other more established uh, in and outgroup biases such as racial bias. So using this insight um, about a uh, political based or political identity based outgroup bias, Michael Lynch in his 2019 book, Know It All Society proposes that a certain kind of arrogance based on our in-group political identity has come to define America's political relationships. This tribal arrogance, as Lynch calls it, is the uh, arrogance of moral certainty, of thinking your side has it all figured out, that you don't need to improve because you are just so great already. Tribal arrogance is then always social in its context. It proposes that we know, they don't. This means the individual is drawing on their membership in a particular political group for this sort of arrogance. And given the aforementioned political polarization of today's America, this means that the political right is generally pitted against the political left as a potential source of this arrogant tribal identity. But as I mentioned briefly in the introduction, the farther right you go on the American political um, spectrum, the more invested its adherents become in white supremacy. And white American women, despite the patriarchal nature of the far right, are not immune to the draws of white supremacy. Um, whether or not they exhibit any uh, conscious cult racial bias. So based on various historical examples that I don't have time to go into right now, um, two that I mentioned elsewhere are Angela Davis's discussion of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in Women, Race, and Class, um, and Elizabeth Gillespie McRae's thesis in her books, Mothers of Massive Resistance. Um, but based on these historical examples, there seem to be two main explanations for white women's move to or adoption of right wing and far right stances. One is the lure of the promises of white supremacy itself. Um, and the second is a path to capitalize on whatever means of advancement was available to them, regardless of the intellectual impact or um, harm it has to others. The problem is that both of these moves are premised on systems of domination where a white identity is more powerful than a female identity. In other words, the structures of white supremacy and patriarchy are intact, and thus these moves to the right allow the women who make them to feel the sort of power that is usually denied to them by their gender under a patriarchal system. Holding the structure of white supremacy um, intact allows them not only to express any racial animus and sense of superiority they may have, but also potentially to choose to identify above all else with the identity that gives them that elevated status position that they are unwilling to relinquish. So how does this help with the dilemma of far right women's simultaneous arrogance and servility? One possibility that comes out of Lynch's discussion of tribal arrogance is that their arrogance and servility may have separate and discrete domains. So the type of arrogance described by Lynch is always directed at the outgroup, and it's necessarily based on their in-group identity of white supremacy. And white supremacy itself will always reinforce this arrogance when confronted with anyone who would contradict it, which is an expected outcome for a privileged group, um, as Tan Alessandra Tonasini mentions in her 2021 book, Mess Measures of the Self. But the domain in which far right women are pressured to be servile does not overlap with the outgroup servility um, or the outgroup that white supremacy is opposed to. So far right women are servile only within their in group. In group servility is premised on their position, uh, their subordinate position in the gendered hierarchy as a woman in a highly patriarchal organization. This in group servility would also be expected as a function of their oppressed position within this group. But white supremacy will not allow its women to be servile to anyone other than white men. 
Their commitment to the reality and importance of the racial hierarchy they believe in is too strong. And even far-right women's in-group servility might be less prominent than we expect. White women in far-right movements often knowingly align themselves with white supremacy despite the inherent misogyny of far-right movements with the expectation that they can push back against the misogynistic norms of their organizations. The problem is that this strategy often seems to fail, and then they face even uh, an even harsher backlash for their, effort, um, for their efforts. So in her article on the misogyny paradox, Tracy Lanera recounts the toxic threats female alt-right propagandists face. They get hate mail, threats of rape and violence, not just from their critics, but also by their fellow alt-right sympathizers, um, abuse against their families. Their very attempts to promote the views of their hate groups earn them the label of a woman failing to meet her submissive expectations, prompting abuse from their compatriots. But conversely, the more submissive alt-right women become in compliance with that prescribed role, the more they feel the misogyny of the men in their organization when their compliance does not exempt them from abuse. This is because these good racist girls may have internalized feminist norms of their right to independent choice and freedom, including their freedom to choose a traditionally submissive female role. When that choice doesn't exempt them from the misogyny of alt-right men, they feel betrayed. Thus, Lenara suggests that they face a damned if you do, damned if you don't paradox that further mystifies the reasons why they stay in their organizations. But even the fact that far-right women have articulated this experience suggests that they have a prima facie ability to recognize the felt harms of reprehensible behavior um, and of the harms of misogyny. It provides the seeds for arguing that they understand the impact of their own reprehensible behavior in the service of white supremacy. And that's all I have for today. Mm -hmm.